Kitchen Night, Terror in Ecuador. Gunman storms TV station during live broadcast. More than 20 violent incidents reported as the country lurches into crisis. The president calls for a state of emergency. Not convinced. Judges skeptical of Trump's presidential immunity argument in election interference case. A federal appeals court signal that it would reject Donald Trump's arguments that he cannot be criminally prosecuted. Costly mistakes? Boeing's CEO admits that his company failed to ensure utmost security to its passengers. Now the Federal Aviation Authority focuses on whether the plane was once again managed to cut corners in its efforts to be airworthy. And chilling in Chile. Surprise guests invades a Chilean protest, which kind of makes us ask the question, who are they fighting for? All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Mahish Jani. Good evening everyone and welcome to World News Tonight. Appreciate your company. A lot of stories from around the world to bring to you tonight. From the latest on Trump's legal troubles to a man in India who travels in style. That's a story that you really have to watch. But we begin tonight in all the way in Ecuador where the country is now in chaos. Ecuador's president, Daniel Noboa, has declared an internal armed conflict in the country, ordering security forces to neutralize several criminal groups accused of spreading extreme violence in the Latin American nation. Now, the decree came uh, shortly after hooded and armed men interrupted a live television broadcast, one of several violent incidents playing out across the country yesterday. Ecuador is in a financial crisis and they sought assistance from the IMF last year and now are fully in the IMF program. Armed men in balaclavas interrupted a live TV broadcast in Ecuador on Tuesday. They stormed the studio a day after President Daniel Noboa declared a national state of emergency, which he later followed with a decree listing 22 gangs as terrorist organizations. The masked men were seen telling staff of the television station TC to get on the floor. A sense of unease settled over Ecuador's capital, Quito, after news of the attack at the TV station. Shops closed early and people rushed home. Residents said they felt the city was in chaos. The TV station attack was the latest in a week of chaos in Ecuador. Over the weekend, Adolfo Macias, the powerful leader of the Los Choneros criminal gang, apparently escaped from the prison where he was serving a 34-year sentence. Meanwhile, there were instances of violence in other prisons, kidnappings of police officers and explosions, including car bombs reported across the country. On Monday, President Noboa declared a 60-day state of emergency and a day later declared the situation an internal armed conflict. Ecuador's military now patrol the streets at night. A curfew has been imposed across the country. Peru on Tuesday declared an emergency along its northern border with Ecuador. Peruvian Prime Minister Alberto Otarola announced soldiers would be sent to help Peruvian police there as violence blamed on criminal gangs surges in its neighbor. Another nation that is in South Asia that is going through an economic crisis is Bhutan and that's why the people of Bhutan, when they went to the polls yesterday, opted to choose a new prime minister and a new government. Former Bhutanese Prime Minister Shering Tobge's People's Democratic Party won the most seats in the election and will form the new government. Bhutan's former Prime Minister Shering Tobge's People's Democratic Party won the most seats in the Bhutan's parliamentary election and will form the new government after the polls dominated by the economic crisis in the Himalayan nation. The Bhutan Broadcasting Service reported yesterday that the PDP had won 30 of the 47 National Assembly seats to return to the power, while the Bhutan Tendral Party had only secured 17. The election campaigns focused on the economic growth and opportunity, despite the country's use of a gross national happiness index in the place of a domestic product. Both parties in the election are committed to a constitutionally enshrined philosophy of the government that measures its success by the happiness and well-being of the people. Bhutan's youth unemployment rate stands at 29% according to the World Bank, while economic growth has sputtered along at an average of 1.7% over the past five years. 
Togbe was the lead of the opposition in Bhutan's first parliament when it was established in 2008, soon after the start of the reign of the present king. He is to become prime minister for the second time. Well, China's new uh, lunar probe, Shanghe 6, has been transported to the Wenxiang uh, spacecraft launch site in the southern province of Hainan. With the launch schedule for the first half of 2024, China National Space Administration uh, said today that the components of the Shanghe 6 probe carried by the AN-124 and Y-20 transport aircraft arrived at the Milan International Airport in Haikon City on Monday and yesterday, respectively, before they were transported by road to the Wenxiang spacecraft launch site, some 80 kilometers away. Pre-launch tests will be carried out as planned, according to uh, the uh, space agency. Now, as part of the fourth phase of China's lunar exploration program, the Shanghe 6 mission will see key technological breakthroughs including lunar uh, retrograde orbit uh, design and control and intelligence uh, sample return from the far side of the moon. We want to take you to Taiwan now as Taiwan's presidential election approaches. The frontline island of Kinmen finds itself at a critical crossroads. Voters on the island are grappling with the impact of their vote on relations with Beijing and the future of the island. Most of Taiwan lies around 100 miles from mainland China. The island of Kinmen, however, is only a short ferry ride away. Tanks and barricades face the skyscrapers of the Chinese city of Xiamen on the horizon. Kinmen is seen in Taiwan as its furthest outpost of democracy, as well as a symbolically important constituency, which attracts visits from the leadership of all of Taiwan's major political parties. As those campaign efforts pick up ahead of Taiwan's presidential election this week, residents of the island, which relies heavily on spending by Chinese tourists, are wondering how their vote will impact relations with Beijing, and in turn, the future of Kinmen. Taiwan has controlled Kinmen since 1949, when the defeated Republic of China government fled to Taipei after losing a civil war with Mao Zedong's communists. Bombarded by hundreds of thousands of shells over decades, the frontline island earned a reputation as the protector of Taiwan. However, over the years, both sides of the water that divides it from mainland China have enjoyed close economic ties. Many families have relatives in both places. The establishment of a 30-minute ferry service in the early 2000s transformed the island into a popular shopping destination for Chinese tourists. Now, both Beijing and Taiwanese opposition party candidates are calling for a bridge between Xiamen and Kinmen, which has divided opinion on the island. While the majority on the island support closer ties, a growing subset of young residents identify more as Taiwanese than Chinese. They want a democratic Kinmen that embraces its own culture and relies less on China. In the run-up to the January 13th election, billboards for Taiwan's ruling DPP party and opposition Kuomintang party alike have sprung up around Kinmen. But for some, like bookstore owner Wang Yuwen, voting along party lines matters less than a candidate's vision for the island's future. Let's get you the latest on Trump's legal troubles now. Uh, appeal court judges have sharply questioned former U.S. President Donald Trump's argument that former presidents should be entitled to immunity from criminal prosecution. Now, in a landmark case, uh, Trump's uh, lawyer said that his time in office protects him from charges connected to his alleged efforts to overturn the 2020 election. A ruling expected any time from the federal appeals court, which appeared deeply skeptical today of Donald Trump's efforts to derail the case about his attempts to overturn the 2020 election. I did nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong. I feel that as a president, you have to have immunity. The Republican front runner watching on in court as his lawyer, John Sauer, urged the three judge panel to break new legal ground and find the former president immune from prosecution, emphasizing everything he's been charged for took place when he was still in the White House. We have the prosecution of the chief political opponent who's winning in every poll and is being prosecuted by the administration that he's seeking to replace. While the Justice Department argues nothing in the Constitution supports shielding Mr. Trump from prosecution now. Never before has there been allegations that a sitting president has 
with private individuals and using the levers of power sought to fundamentally subvert the democratic republic and the electoral system. It would be awfully scary if there weren't some sort of mechanism by which to reach that uh, in, criminally. Judge Florence Pan, a Biden appointee, posing stark hypotheticals on what a future president could do if Mr. Trump's view prevailed. Could a president order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival? The answer in Sauer's view, yes, so long as the president was impeached and convicted first, pinning much of his argument on the Senate acquitting Mr. Trump at his 2021 impeachment trial, a position DOJ cast as frightening. What kind of world are we living in? The president has a unique constitutional role, but he is not above the law. Well, let's get the latest on that story. And for that, let's cross over to other veterans, Nicola Seneviratna, who's standing by in New York with the latest. Nicola, uh, when can we expect a verdict on this? Yes, Mahesh. We can expect a speedy verdict considering the efficiency of the rest of the proceedings related to the case. The more likely outcome, as per what the pundits are saying, is that the three-judge panel rules against Mr. Trump, rejecting his claims of immunity. At that point, he could seek to have the entire circuit court hear the appeal, a move that, if nothing else, would eat up more time. If the full court declined to take the case or rule against him, he too would most likely to ask the Supreme Court to step in. Considering the 6-3 to three conservative majority of the Supreme Court, things may be looking up for Trump in that regard. However, Mahesh, it remains to be seen exactly where a sitting president stands alongside or above the law when the U.S. Supreme Court hears the argument on February 8. Back to you, Mahesh. Absolutely. We'll, uh, definitely we'll be watching uh, Nicholas and Viratna reporting from uh, New York. USA. Let's take a short commercial break. Move our news right after this. Welcome back, everyone, to World News. Let's take you to Japan. While Japan is still reeling from the powerful New Year's Day earthquake, the Japan Japanese Meteorological Agency reported another magnitude of 6-point um, earthquake of central Japan late yesterday. Meanwhile, officials said that the death toll from the 7.6 magnitude earthquake, which struck central Japan on January 1st, crossed the 200 mark. The death toll from the earthquake that hit the Noto Peninsula on Japan's west coast exceeded 200 as cold with the hampered search efforts for those still missing today. Police and rescue workers were seen this morning searching through the rubble of the collapsed buildings. Cold and heavy rain were forecast in the region with the highest temperature expected to reach 4 degrees Celsius in the city of Wajima. According to Japan's Defense Ministry, the government has deployed 6,300 soldiers from the self-defense force to Keikit areas and large-scale search operations had started in severely hit areas yesterday. As of today morning, 203 people were confirmed dead and 68 are still missing. The departments report that more earthquakes can be expected over the following days. Well, after loose balls were found in several Boeing MAX 737 9 aircrafts across the world, the management of the company is eating humble pie tonight while accepting the fault on failure to detect the errors on the fuselage of the aircraft. Days after the mid-air panel blowout from an Alaska airline jet, Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun said, and acknowledge that the plane maker made a mistake telling staff that it would work with regulators to make sure that it can never happen again. Other than Anuradha Anuradhi Vikramasinghe is following that story tonight and she joins me right here in the studio. Anuradhi, good to see you. Um, what exactly is the latest on this story? Uh, does Boeing is going back and making sure that the entire fleet is being grounded until they make sure that mm, there is no error at all? Yeah, well, it's great to see you too as well, Mahish. But currently, it seems like Boeing is going from in the frying pan right into the fire as we see Boeing shares sliding drastically on the stock market. We also see that it is still unclear exactly when clearance will be given for the 737 MAX 9s to resume flights. Here's a look at the latest on the Boeing debacle. 
Four days after that mid-air decompression explosion on an Alaska Airlines MAX 9, Boeing CEO told employees in a safety stand down today, we are acknowledging our mistake. Looking at the gaping hole, I've got kids, I've got grandkids, and so do you. This stuff matters, every detail matters. The focus of the investigation, that door plug that blew out of the plane Friday, held in position using 12 stop pads and four bolts. But the NTSB says it may have shifted out of alignment. The bolts are missing. A lab analysis will determine if they were ever in place. Now, both United and Alaska Airlines say they found loose bolts and hardware in more grounded MAX 9s. The door plug that blew out Friday landed behind high school teacher Bob Sauer's house. With every MAX 9 grounded ahead of FAA inspections, the FAA today said the safety of the flying public, not speed, will determine the timeline for returning the Boeing MAX 9 to service. A former Boeing whistleblower who testified in Congress about two fatal MAX 8 crashes fears Boeing's culture has not changed. If things don't change, it's going to be a major tragedy and it's going to be horrible for families. Well, it seems that Boeing continues to hit further turbulence in all areas and especially in the global markets as well as Indonesian flight carrier Lion Air has grounded all of their Boeing 737 MAX 9s from their service. Mahish. Indeed, uh, it doesn't seem like that uh, this entire story is going to go away, Anra, the end, uh, apparently. Let's hope and see this time that they would actually do the right thing so anybody who's flying um, the Boeing aircrafts are safe. Thank you very much. All right, uh, let's get you the latest on the road to the White House. Now, with six days to go until Iowa's caucuses uh, kicks off the Republican presidential nominating calendar, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis no longer predicts victory for him and instead vows that we are going to do well here in Iowa. Now, DeSantis uh, at a Fox News town hall uh, yesterday in Iowa's capital and largest city emphasized that, that the battle for the GOP nomination is a long process and pledge that he's in it for the long haul. During the town hall uh, event, several protesters uh, interjected, calling to stop drilling for oil. You know, I think it is important to stand for a culture of life. I'm the only one running that has actually enacted no protections for the sanctity no of life. Money. I'm the only no one that's been able to do hold that. On, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. No, oil no oil money. money. No oil money. No oil money. No oil money. You know, you live and you learn with these people, right? <laughs> All right. All right. Well, you guys, that was a mistake. You guys didn't get that one right. Okay. So... So I do think it's important to, um, uh, you have to look to see uh, our countries based on the idea our rights come from God, uh, and among these are the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So that right to life is paramount. It's in the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. So the question is, if you have an unborn with a detectable heartbeat, um, I think it's compassionate to be able to respect that and to be able to protect that going forward. And you do that in ways that are compassionate with everybody yeah. uh, and understanding the, the issues that you're dealing with. But I'll tell you what, in Florida, we've put our money where our mouth is on this. My wife Governor. has led a program. We're okay. Down on the Thank time you so much. Okay. So sorry. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Well, over a million people from all around the world will be in Paris exactly 200 days from today. Well, they're not there to celebrate love, but the city will be loved by all sports fans as Paris is expected to host the 2024 Summer Games uh, of the Olympics in mid, uh, mid this year. Uh, other than us, Chetan Dharmaratne is watching that story for us uh, from Normandy, France and joins me now via Zoom. Chetana. Indeed, Mahish. Macron said there's a plan B, plan C, and etc. when asked if the security situation currently marked by high tightened alert across Europe over tensions in the Middle East could thought plans to hold the ceremony as planned. Macron said he was against doom saying and changing plans hazardly but added a plan B could be triggered if the level of insecurity requires us to revisit the initial scheme. Europe's security officials have warned of a growing risk of attacks by Islamist militants amid the israel Hamas war, with the biggest threat likely from the lone wolf assailants who are hard to attack. 
France raised its security threshold in October when a Shashagan origin man with a knife killed a teacher in school in northern France. The country's sports minister ruled out a change of plans after a man armed with a knife and a hammer killed a German tourist and left two people wounded near the Eiffel Tower. Macra did not go into details of an alternative ceremony could look like. France expects some 600,000 visitors when 160 boats are due to set off July 26 from the Pont d'Australis for a 6km journey to the Pont d'Iena in an event of Tony Estanguet. The head of organizing committee described as unique and spectacular. This, is, this comes as France Prime Minister Elisabeth Born is, is to leave office after less than two years in the job. Her resignation comes with a President Emmanuel Macron widely expects to reshuffle his top team ahead of European elections due, to, due later this year. In statement, Mr. Macron said Mr. Bone had shown courage, commitment and determination during her time in office. Back to you, Mahish. Absolutely. Uh, Chetana Dharmaratna, other than as a special correspondent reporting from Normandy, France. Thank you. Well, a break now. More World News right after this. Welcome back everyone to World News. Now, what's the craziest looking car you ever driven? Now, the man you are about to uh, see has driven the wackiest looking vehicles, literally. We're talking about burgers, pencils and even a snooker table. In Hyderabad, India, you can find the world's first and only handmade wacky car museum called Sudha Cars Museum. Your average commute is pretty rubbish unless you get to drive one of these. In the city of Hyderabad, India, you'll find the ultimate motorhead. But he's not just a collector. Sudhakar makes the world's craziest cars. From everyday objects like a computer, tennis ball or burger, to a toilet and a Christmas tree, he's made just about anything you can think of. This is the only handmade wacky car museum in the world. Uh, well, I've created about uh, 700 uh, different type of uh, vehicles. Uh, at the age of 14, I started. Growing up near local junkyards, Sudhakar was always finding something to build. But it wasn't always cars. His love of wheels started with bicycles. And after that, I worked on a lot of motorcycles, uh, vintage cars vintage double-decker buses for the tourism. The first wacky car I made is a shoe-shaped car and then I made a camera car. But Sudhakar did not stop there. He went on to make hundreds of wacky designs. Cricket bat-shaped car, cricket ball-shaped car, football, basketball, golf ball, Christmas tree-shaped car, mug shaped car. He's even made a drivable snooker table. In the beginning, people used to call me mad, a circus guy. I love doing it, I enjoy doing it, and uh, that is more important. So that excitement is still there. Well, before we end uh, tonight's news, a group of sea lions and seagulls decided to take a trip about, uh, around the town uh, during a fisherman's protest in the town of Vilparaiso in southern Chile recently. Three southern sea lions were seen calmly walking in front of police vehicles during a blockade. Over them, a flock of seagulls flew while others ate fish on an armoured vehicle's hood. What are they protesting? Maybe they need more fish? Uh, that is a part of your world tonight. Thank you very much for watching. I'll be back again tomorrow at the same time on World News Tonight. See you then. Bye for now.